this screen share desktop or window. So that is what I'm going. So um, physical exercise when compulsory does no harm to the body, but knowledge which is acquired in compulsion obtains no hold on mind. Um, with these words, I like to welcome you all in the today's webinar, Multifunctional Materials, um, organized by our Team 2020 Helpers in association with Government Arts College, Department of Physics. I welcome our guest lecturer, uh, Sankari Nadupalli, ma'am, and also G. Sivakami as a convener. Uh, without any delay, I would like to request our speaker to start the session as we have already gone very delayed. Please, ma'am. Yeah, very well. Uh, thank you so much, Moaz, again, for putting up with me and have being patient when I was having technical difficulties. And thank you, everyone, for actually waiting. So, um, so let's start. Um, so today we'll be talking about um, the re real subject, unlike last time when we just brushed through a lighter topic. So we were just testing waters last time. So today we'll be diving into the subject. So today's focus topic, as you all know, uh, will be uh, multifunctional materials. Um, uh, so structure, defects, and its properties. So we will be indulging in the aspects of material structure, effect, and its properties. Um, so uh, not just humans, uh, for centuries, as we all know, um, that uh, we have an inherent sense of um, using materials uh, uh, for specific purposes. For example, for uh, slicing, for cutting, for hammering, or for picking things up, um, we have all always used, or for assistance, for example, walking sticks. So we have an inherent capability to uh, procure materials from the nature and uh, use them for specific purposes. So going down this line, um, and humankind for centuries have mined, they have industrialized, uh, developed, and manufactured several ma uh, materials. Uh, for um, domestic use, uh, for industrial use, and also in the medical setting also now we have uh, started to use several uh, materials. So um, why do we use these materials? It is their property uh, specifically, which are grounds on which we um, obtain and use these materials. What kind of properties? Sometimes it can be mechanical properties um, when it comes to hammering, cutting, and using it as a mechanical instrument. It can be an optical material, for example, a magnifying glass, which we use to actually see things properly, um, and sometimes even electrical, which is an, and thermal properties, for example, copper pots, copper wires, the same material being used also to make chai in it, and also used for uh, electric current. It's a conductive material, both thermally and electrically. So these kinds of properties, the electrical, mechanical, optical, thermal, are uh, the properties on which are determinants of why and how we use these materials. So uh, not just using one single material. What we also did is we used alloys of different materials. For example, in steel, we use different kinds of materials um, in order to uh, improve, enhance its functionality, meaning improve its um, material properties, improve um, corrosion, to reduce the corrosion, um, and uh, to actually have a longevity of it. So improve the life lifespan of the material also. So um, after a lot of scientific investigations and discoveries, uh, what we have uh, essentially found out was uh, the properties of each of these materials is uh, very and uh, has a very close and a direct connection to what it is made of. So essentially, the building blocks of the materials, that what and how it is made, uh, is what determines the properties of the material. So, uh, keeping now keeping that uh, concept aside, uh, let's also think about what we see in the recent um, years is device manufacturization, wherein um, uh, 
essentially these this kind of device miniaturization needs also materials to be in a smaller uh, form so uh, why why do we uh, we need to increase uh, we wanted to increase the mobility of the devices that we use um, and we need to find we wanted to find a ways to enhance the properties um, so particularly because we are miniaturizing devices we also need to see these materials in its nano and micro forms in in that those scale or dimension so it's not just the bulkiness uh, that we wanted to reduce but also we wanted to reduce also the material cost because if it is bulky we use a lot of it a lot of the material if the same material with the same properties are transferred then we use very less of that material than for the, for the cost and also for also to reduce the manufacturing uh, time and also the cost is why uh, we opt for device miniaturization so uh, since due to those ideas and going down in the that line uh, we are continuously striving to develop a new material or solution to demand uh, what is what is this it's an efficient mobility and we are looking at energy storage um or energy harvesting and we want materials which are uh, which which can improve healthcare which can actively sense um and um diagnose um uh, our uh, body the functions um, and also um morph and adapt into different forms um and also be non toxic and bio now all of these kind of uh, phenomena or uh, these uh, properties is what we want from materials and that is when we look into multifunctionality where it, we can't use several materials then it will become too bulky using the same or very few of those materials in order to extract all these properties or all these functions um is what is called multifunctionality so uh, multifunctional functionality or multifunctional materials as the term itself suggests the material uh, takes responsibility to perform various functions or we are looking for materials which can simultaneously at the same time um, do multiple functions so uh, for example the most easiest example is a material which can detect fracture and at the same time uh which can power the signal transmission uh so once it has a small little fracture it will also detect that it has a fracture and also transmits um that it has a fracture and where it has a fracture so this is multifunctional okay two functions but still multifunctional so typical multifunctional materials can be autonomic so by autonomic um what do you mean is um to sense and to diagnose Uh, to respond to external stimuli and um, uh, to also transfer the uh, the stimulus signal with minimum external um, intervention and these materials these multifunctional materials could also be adaptive meaning to readjust to um, change their functionality uh, to change their shape and structural um, uh, properties on demand and these materials should also be self sustaining meaning it should be power harvesting it should be self reliable where it harvests and also utilizes the energy while in function and um, also transmits without any use of another transmission device and of course uh, the most essential should also be reliable so the lifetime li- life span should be um, sufficient for the use function and again uh, that being it um, and it should not um, malfunction when it needs to be operated and also should degrade at this first specific point so that is how we have to make the material or choose the material so that kind of um, these kind of features being auto- autonomic being adaptive self sustaining and reliable are uh, the main grounds on which the material can be multifunction so uh, moving on moving forward on this idea since we have this brief introduction of uh, what we are looking for in a multifunctional material or what multifunctional materials are we will be today we will be to- i will um, divide my talk into three specific um, um sectors or three specific 
part and uh, Moz, uh, please um, tell me when I'm exceeding my time such that I will accommodate my each uh, we will see how much I can talk about each of these topics. Mm. So yeah, so no issue, first, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So first we will be talking about um, the structure, symmetry, defects and properties of these materials. Since we talk about how uh, uh, what the material is made of and how is it made of is essentially a determining factor of its property. So we'll look into that. And um, we will next we will talk about uh, defect structure and properties of um, one of so these both are use cases. So these are uh, things that I have already worked on. So we will brush upon the defect structure and properties of zinc oxide. And then we will talk about um, a polar oxide um, uh, and we will look into the light induced phenomena in um, these uh, kind of polar oxide crystals, specifically lithium ionic. So one thing when you, um, in the first section here, the structure symmetry and defect properties, the reason I put a rango here, a column here, which we are all familiar with is, um, since the ancient times we have a tendency to see uh, and perceive symmetry, which is very pleasing to the eye. And surprisingly, um, symmetry and structure is what which is very important for us to notice in order to find what kind of properties the materials would give. So um, let's uh, now have a small interaction. So you see three pictures here, right? Can anybody tell me what the first, second, and Anyone? Yeah, so I will anyway continue. It'd be very um, nice. Yes. yes, please. Well, first one is silicon dioxide. Yeah, first is silicon dioxide. The second one is also silicon dioxide. Yeah, OK, I will now continue. It would be very nice if someone actually comes up and speaks. It's OK to be wrong. So yeah, so the first picture that you can see here is actually quartz. Now, quartz is very famous. Um, it's a material which is being used in, uh, it's very heavily used in timekeeping. And it's also very famous with hobbyists, the crystal hobbyists. But um, so this basically, quartz is basically crystalline form of silicon dioxide. Um, and the second material that you see here is very famous too in our country, which is tourmaline. So tourmaline is basically used in jewelry. Um, and the difference between uh, the quartz and tourmaline or uh, single crystalline silicon dioxide and borosilicate, for example, is the composition. What you have here is basically silicon dioxide with boron in it. And then you have some transition metal elements, which is uh, chromium, iron and that's what makes um, this different from silicon dioxide itself so what you see the difference that you see here is that it's a borosilicate and it also has transition metal impurities and the third one um, it's sad that no one can guess it but it's emerald which is revered as a beauty once it is cut which is polished and it is faceted it is sold for billions and the larger it is, and if it is this kind of a crystal, if you have it at your house, people are going to literally give you billions and uh, take it. Um, so, but the fantastic point of this is also silicon dioxide. It is similar to quartz, but it has other compositions or other metals, metal impurities in it. So these are kind of defects which make it different from silicon dioxide. So the structure, the symmetry, also changes sometimes because of the defects incorporated in the material itself. And then you can see most of the, the basic thing is silicon dioxide, but the reason you find 
um, its structure or the symmetry changing and also its uh, color changing here is uh, the, the note the indication here of the change in color is that it has different optical properties and the optical properties are changed because of these defects or uh, this additional elements in the crystal so for, for our eye from the picture what we see is an indication that it optical um, structure or uh, optical properties are changed but essentially they might be a possibility that it's mechanical that it's um, or electrical and thermal properties are also changing which we can't see visually but we have to sit and measure another fantastic thing that we can see here is quartz doesn't shine as much as emerald so that is another thing. Even diamond, for example, it shines a lot. It's not just because it is cut and faded to polish. It's because of its optical properties, specifically the refractive index and the way light really gets out of the crystal. So that is also one of the reasons why uh, diamond and emerald, these things are heavily uh, referred as beauty uh, crystal um, and is used in jewelry. But now diamond, there's a saying also that diamond cuts diamond. So diamond, apart from its optical properties, the easiest thing a layman would also know that it is hard. It's a hard material, meaning the Young's module is quite hard. So one has to notice here when we're talking about defects and properties and structure and symmetry that the tiny changes in a crystal, meaning an incorporation of a defect, an incorporation of an element, an incorporation of an impurity of the composition can drastically change uh, the structure and the properties of the crystal. So since we've talked about it, now most of you people, since um, you are um, now studying um, your bachelor's or your master's or doing your PhDs, uh, you guys must know already about the fundamentals of material science. And the fundamentals of material science, uh, they would talk about crystal classes. Now, what are these crystal classes? The monoclinic, the triclinic, the tetragonal, orthorhombic, rhombohydral, and um, the other hexagonal um, uh, crystal classes. Now, these crystal classes are basically shaped in structure, what they're talking about. And they are determined, they are determined uh, by, uh, the classes are determined by uh, the lattice parameters. Now, what are the lattice parameters? Let's just have a quick look at it. I'm not going to into detail about it because it's basic. So, lattice, so how the crystal classes are determined is, if you have atoms on every corner of this, um, cube here, this dot cube here. So the distances between the neighboring atoms, for example, um, is the distance. So it's A, B, B, and C. So it's the lattice distance. And then the angles in which um, the atoms are arranged. So depending upon them is how you classify a crystal class, right? So when A is equal to B is equal to C, and if the angles, all of the angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, are 90, then it becomes cubic. Now, what is cubic? Crystal class, the one thing that should come directly into your head when it is cubic is a common salt that has a cubic uh, structure. Okay. It, it falls into the cubic crystal class. So um, then there are even hexagonal crystal classes where A is equal to B and uh, it's, it's not equal to C. And when alpha and beta, two of the angles are 90 and one of the angles is 120, then it becomes hexagonal. So this is a crystal class. But another thing that once, uh, which is very interesting to notice, um, um, or even in your free time to do this mental exercise is to look at the symmetries. So we will um, uh, dwell into it, but initially let's uh, look at some kinds of symmetries to actually understand the notation, what we, what this symmetry is. So uh, apart from the crystal classes and determination by the lattice parameters, one thing we see is these lattice parameters, these atoms not, are not just situated at the corners of the cube, but in the bulk form, they repeat themselves in order to make a huge supercell. So it's not just one unit cell, but a super cell. So in order to become a super cell, it multiplies itself. So how it is arranged in a super cell, how this primitive cell is arranged in the super cell is what symmetry is all about. So here, when I say I, it is identity. So we are using this symbol because it's very easy to understand. And we will also look at this symbol. So this, is, this will be easy for us to understand another kind of symmetry. 
So an identity here is nothing but a translation. So we are, if, if, if the same crystal structure is translated, let's say this is the kind of structure we are looking at, and if it's translated into an identity, and these are all operation. Now identity operation will make the symmetry of the main primitive crystal the same. And then you have mirror symmetry operation, which is which is actually a mirror. So you see this line here. So if this is the mirror, then the mirror image or mirror symmetry exactly ima mirror images or converts it to a mirror image of the same primitive crystal. Another thing which we notice is a rotational symmetry, which is you take this and you rotate it 120 degrees. This occurs. You, you take this and then you again rotate it 120. So this is this kind of rotation symmetry also is noticed in crystals. It's called three-fold symmetry. A similar thing, which is if it is 180 and even 90. So it's 180, it's two-fold and four-fold. Of course, you can also have a six-fold symmetry. And very recently. Um, it was once a Nobel Prize winner uh, recently also uh, came up with five-fold symmetry, but it's still theoretical and it is based completely on theory. And I have personally not come across a five-fold rotational symmetry crystal. So if I do, I would come back to you. And another thing is um, the inversion symmetry. So you see, you see this dot now. If you invert it, if you rotate it and invert it, it is actually a mirror symmetry. But here, uh, when the primitive cell is centrosymmetric, or if it is round, for example, and you invert it, meaning ulta karna, you just take inside and put it out, uh, it is still the same. And these kind of inversion, if it has an end bar, you know, the bar on the top shows that it is centrosymmetric, or there's an inversion symmetry. Any crystal which has an inver inversion symmetry is centrosymmetric by rule. So that is nice. So these kind of symmetries, for example, the mirror symmetry and the rotation symmetry are something that you can also see in letters and alphabets, for example, that's the best kind of exercise anyone can do. For example, A, the alphabet A is a capital form. If you put a line exactly in the middle of A, it's actually, there is a, you can actually see a mirror symmetry. Example, even C, for example, the alphabet, capital alphabet C, uh, you can also see the same thing. So if I, is the alphabet C. Oh, oh. So if there is the alphabet C, for example, and you put a line in between, that is kind of uh, mirror symmetry. And same for A, for example, if you put a line in between, and you see O, alphabet O has a mirror symmetry in this way, has a mirror symmetry in that way. You can even rotate it in different forms and still has a rotation symmetry, it has a mirror symmetry, it is even, it can even be inverted. The O has uh, inversion symmetry and central symmetric also. So this kind of mental exercise, and even with uh, Kolam, for example, even with Rangoli, this kind of exercise is fantastic for our head when we're talking about symmetry. So uh, yeah, so let's get into uh, um, the theoretical part of these kind of symmetries that we see in structure. So we have central symmetry, uh, which is the inversion, the bar. And then we have mirror symmetry, rotation, and rot rotary inversion, wherein you rotate and you invert. Now, we don't have two bar here, for example. Um, that is because um, it, two bar is nothing but a mirror symmetry. Um, if you had noticed uh, when I've spoken about it um, in the previous slide. So uh, just count the number. So this kind of notation, or there are several kinds of notation when you want to look, show symmetry. So what I'm showing here is Hermann Magwin um, a notation, um, type of notation. So the number of operations, so the, all these things are called symmetry operators. So the number of operators that are possible for each kind of operation is, uh, so when, you, when you add all, all of them, you get 10. And combination of all these symmetries, meaning rotation, one rotation or two rotation, symmetries and one mirror or two mirrors uh, which are orthogonal to each other and one rotation axis. All kinds of uh, combinations of these symmetry operations will give you basically 32 point group symmetries and that's how theor theorists or crystallographers classify them. To make it very easy for people who are working in between the fields of experimental physics where you want to look at properties of a crystal 
and also look at the structure and determine what exact properties that you have to look, look at and how they are all interrelated, how these properties are interrelated. So, um, so to make it very easy, uh, let's look at this supercell. Now we have to look at what we have looked at previously was this only one kind of primitive unit cell, but what you see here is a supercell wherein you see these uh, purple dots which are situated at the vertices of these kind of a grid that we notice, the black grid. And then you have several other um, atoms also, neighboring atoms to the purple balls, your green and other tiny things, which are also stereoscopic. You see some are rotated like this, some are like that. So in order to determine the unit cell or the primitive unit cell in which you choose, you need to choose one kind of a primitive unit cell um, and then apply symmetry on it to actually um, explain or it should be a translation of the supercell. So in order to do that, uh, let's simplify this and we will see which one is the best way, which kind of a primitive cell would be the best um, option for us to look at or determine the symmetry of this kind of a crystal. So if you are taking off all the background or the neighboring atoms and we're just looking at the purple balls here, uh, so it's the same thing. We are putting these purple balls on this grid. So several kinds of options or choices of uh, primitive unit cells can be chosen from here, which will be this, the red one and the green one here. Um, so these are all just uh, four atoms situated at the corners of your unit cell. Or the primitive cell. And here the green, the same thing. Now, here in the light blue one, what you have is one sitting either on the center or the face of this uh, plane. Now, uh, another thing, uh, another one which we have to notice is the navy blue one, wherein you have four similar to this, we have four sitting in the corners, uh, vertices of this primitive cell, and one at the center. Now, out of all of these, as you notice, one which carries most information of how and what and where the atoms are arranged is this. Which one? The one which is drawn in the navy blue. So this is called a supersymmetrical primitive cell, or you can call it whatever you want, but it carries most information. And then you can translate this. You can um, put in all the kinds of operations that you notice as to how it is, um, how, how the entire supercell structure is. But this will show you exactly where the planes are, uh, where the mirror plane would be, uh, how does it translate, and what kind of rotation, um, if you apply a rotational operator, if you apply, does it look the same or not? So this will be the basis on which you would uh, determine the properties of the entire uh, crystal. So, um, so I'm just showing you a small example here because for me, when I have started learning crystallography, also it, it it became slightly difficult to actually picture or image this kind of rotational symmetry and what kind of plane uh, and mirror symmetry. What are these planes? So, it, see, uh, now I have an example here for you for you uh, to make it very clear what kind of or what what do you what I I mean by rotational symmetry. So. You can see these red balls in a grid here. So if this is a supercell, and this is basically, you are looking at the A, B plane. So you're looking at only a two-dimensional picture of it. And then when this same thing has a rotational symmetry, when, when you apply a rotational symmetry operation over it, um, a rotational angle gamma, with a rotational angle gamma along the B axis, and that is when, when you rotate this along this direction, uh, that is when you see another plane here, yeah, the one which is unfit. So you have to basically, when you're looking at rotational, op when, when you are applying symmetry operations like a rotational operation or a mirror operation, these are play rotational operations are always along an axis. And then uh, you have mirror symmetries which are planes. Uh, so this is something which you can definitely visualize um, in a 2D format, but it would be best if it is in your head in a three-dimensional format. So, uh, 
So I, I had been talking about these symmetries uh, and brushing up on them quite quickly because I have less time. But if you are really interested in it, because it's a fantastic subject, very interesting, you can have the free courses on the internet. I, I started off with MIT's crystallography course, and there are, there, are, there are several courses. You can go down here. I mean, the references, I put a link which also has the uh, text format of this, and there are also textbooks. But there are YouTube videos of uh, crystallography, um, classes on crystallography from MIT, and they're quite good. I think if you go through it and then read some textbooks, that'd be fantastic. Um, so yeah, so come to it. So you have your crystalline uh, classes. And as I've told you last time, uh, that there's, there's all these symmetry operations, combinations of all these kind of symmetry operations, theorists have come up with, they classified the entire five crystals into a 32 um, point group symmetries. So these kind of point group symmetries are what? Which will determine uh, the properties of the crystal. So if you look at it, it says, um, so one kind of common symmetry in triclinic class of crystals is a one fold um, axis. So one fold axis and one inversion symmetry also exists. And the common is one two fold um, uh, rotational axis. Uh, which is 2m and 2 by m, which is orthogonal to the rotational axis, and then threefold. And then you have all these kind of um, symmetry operations or point group uh, symmetries, which will determine how exactly the symmetry of the supercell, supercrystalline cell is. So now let's jump into the properties of it after talking so much about point group symmetries. So how um, the 32 out of 32 crystalline uh, crystallographic point groups um, we can arrange the properties in this way wherein 11 of all the 32 crystallographic point groups that you've seen in this previous slide 11 of them are centrosymmetric yeah so these centrosymmetric crystalline structures are non-polar and hence uh, uh, they do not show any kind of other properties and out of the rest of them, out of the rest, so the 21 crystals which are left, um, so crystallographic point groups which are left, all of them show exhibit um, piezoelectric properties. So they are polar because of their symmetry itself, meaning when you apply um, stress, a, a compressive stress or strain on the crystal, you it. it it shows a uh, amount of voltage depending upon the crystal itself and depending upon how much the atom is displaced from its center. So, so now that is determined on how where the atom is placed, but all these kind of symmetric point groups display piezoelectricity. And out of them, uh, 10 of them display pyroelectric um, or um, pyroelectric uh, property because they exhibit spontaneous polarization and due to this kind of spontaneous polarization and one kind of direction when you apply heat to the crystal so these things see the pyroelectric crystals also exhibit piezoelectric so not all piezoelectric are pyroelectric but all pyroelectric are piezoelectric so it's a set in between inside the piezoelectric so, so when you apply heat to these specific crystals um, it exhibits a bit of voltage, and when you apply voltage, it, it's also inverse. So inverse piezoelectric, inverse pyroelectric also exists. And out of the set, out of the pyroelectric crystals, now there are 10 uh, crystals, 10 types of um, crystallographic point groups um, in crystals which are ferroelectric, meaning that when you apply an electric field, the polarization reverses, and then again it gets back. So does have a spontaneous polarization, but when, when you apply an electric field, it, there's a polarization reversal, and you also see a remnant polarization, just, just like most um, ferroelectric. Now, all these kind of properties, for example, are very important for um, utilization of materials for different uses. Now, when you see a ferroelectric crystal, it is pyroelectric, piezoelectric, it's polar, so it is essentially multiferroid, uh, multifunctional. And sometimes these ferroelectric crystals also have several optical properties thanks to it, thanks to it, crystal structure, the symmetry of it. The so symmetry is what determines how the light passes through the atom and how it gets out, how what the light, how does the light interact with the matter inside the crystal. 
um, oh, and also how does the light or, or all these kind of electric mechanical stress or thermal or electrical field uh, really interact with the defects inside the crystal. So, so this is a nice um, table to a cheat cheat sheet, for example, to quickly determine if you see a crystal, you know its symmetry, what kind of properties that, that you see in it. I think this is kind of a cheat sheet. Um, so yeah, so now we've talked about symmetry and properties. Let's dive into case one uh, quickly, uh, which is uh, zinc oxide. Now the crystal uh, structure here, zinc oxide, is a brutzite uh, based uh, structure. So it has a 6 mm uh, point group symmetry. And if you can see here, see, there is this M mirror plane and there is this A mirror plane. And then the polarization is along uh, the C axis, and here they're showing you the C plane, which is a polar plane, but then the polarization is along this axis. And since this crystal is non centrosymmetric, it is polar, it exhibits spontaneous polarization. And ZNO is revered to have good piezoelectric properties and also optical properties. So yeah, let's look at the properties that this kind of symmetry would bring up. So, uh, so yeah, Zeno is a, is a semiconductor. So it's a wide band cap semiconductor. Um, it, it exhibits piezoelectricity, and I've said um, uh, it also exhibits. So some of the these crystalline structures also exhibit optical properties. So it has it has luminescence, and hence it is also used in uh, displays, display technology, where it emits different kinds of light, so R, G, V, so it does, it does emit uh, different wavelengths of lights, um, so it is also used in displays, display technology. And um, it is also used in solar cells, and even it has also exhibits some amount of radiation hardness, and several other pro uh, properties, and due to these kind of properties, for example, um, it is used in LEDs, you see, all these kinds of um, property um, functions that it enables. So ZFO is basically from a multifunctional material. From this, that is what we are getting to know from this. So I will talk about, um, I, I will not be talking about the specific property that I am now going to tell you, but uh, ZNO recently um, is also known as, um, if you add another transition metal, Meaning, if you add an extrinsic defect to it, for example, a transition metal property, ZNO is also called, it becomes suddenly magnetic also, meaning that it, it is semiconducting and it is also magnetic. So these things are called diode magnetic semiconductor. Um, yeah, so um, let's just look at the structure now. Now, these kind of pristine unit cells doesn't necessarily need to have extrinsic defects, but also intrinsic ones are inevitable when you grow these crystals. Either you, if you deposit them or you're growing them or you find it naturally, as you had seen from quartz and other crystals which are naturally formed, tourmaline and emerald, you have several intrinsic, inevitable intrinsic and extrinsic defects. So in ZNO, the kind of defects that you would also see are oxygen vacancy, wherein the lack of oxygen is called the oxygen vacancy. And sometimes the lack of zinc atom site, which is called the zinc vacancy. And due to this, there are several changes in the optical properties. And these kind of optical properties and electronic properties are because of this kind of vacancy. When oxygen has a vacancy, and then there is a distortion in the local crystalline structure. And this kind of distortion is what is um, the reason behind. Um, change in properties or manipulation of properties can be done by changing the intrinsic defects or by modulating. while you are synthesizing the material itself, you can modulate your composition in a way or um, sintering conditions in a way to modulate the intrinsic defects. So what you're seeing here is a small little nanostructure, unlike a supercell, meaning few um, primitive units that are arranged in all, all of space with several defects that you're seeing. So what we did here is uh, electron paramagnetic resonance um, to see um, if there is any influence, if, if you can see the vacancies, uh, why are this technique? 
So when we did, so these, this kind of technique, what it does is it looks at the outermost electrons on each of these atoms' shell and determines its spin in order to get us the valence of it. So that way, we'd know how much of this kind of an electron around, electron cloud around these atom, uh, atom spin is. And according to that, we can determine what is it that we are seeing in this EPR line. That is to dumb it down and the basic way uh, to explain EPR. So what we see is, um, we see this signal here, and then in, when, when we are going down from bulk to a nano dimension, we also see this little line. So we, 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 you know that there's a combination of all these defects in the bulk form. So, so what we are seeing here is basically probably a core uh, defect. Um, and then what we see here is particularly different from the bulk is something which is specific to the nano dimension. Uh, so we are first initially we we'll go with this and hypothesize that since these nano dimension ZNO has more surface um, uh, area, and hence what we are seeing here is due to the increased surface area and reduced dimension as compared to bulk. So we can directly relate it from that first assumption itself. We can say that oh. Uh, the signal that we are seeing in EPR in nano dimension comes from the shell of uh, or the outer surface area of the nanoparticle. And the one which you can see here must be because of the core or the bulk of the crystal itself. So I think I have all, what we are almost done, but I will just quickly go through optical properties of this uh, that and all. So if you're interested, you can actually go down and read my paper, which is there in the references. Um, so yeah. So what we see in the bulk and the nano dimensions is also that it also emits, as I told you, there are optical properties also. So what it is doing is it is emitting a blue light, emitting a green light, and several kinds of uh, wavelengths of light. So here we have in the x-axis we have the wavelength, and then we have the intensity of illumination, photoluminescence illumination. And of course, it does have an exotonic um, illumination, meaning the blue illumination. But what you can see from the bulk to the nano scale is it also has an extent extensive, very good green illumination. Isn't it nice that we can actually just change dimension of a material in order to get a very functional property out of it, which is emitting this green signal. Apart from the property, these kind of studies can also shine light onto what kind of defects we are seeing and what kind of dimension of the particle. So what we saw was different methods of synthesis. So SS here, it's solid state and this is hydrolysis. So different kind of synthesis pro uh, procedures um, also uh, change the optical properties of uh, ZNO. Meaning you can increase the green light illumination or increase, decrease the blue light illumination or increase the blue light illumination but decrease the green light. So you can modulate the properties that you see just by changing the dimension of the particle itself. So coming to the next um, uh, material, which is lithium nitrate. here you can see these beautiful crystals. They're very similar to emerald, very similar to all these uh, naturally forming crystals that you see, very shiny. But in the lab, we just cut it. We do not face it and polish it. Of course, polish to optical grade, but we do not face it for it to show its beautiful attractive properties. Um, but this kind of a crystal, now these kind of, all these kind of crystals, for example, calcium titanate, barium titanate, are all ABO3 polar oxide crystals. They have a spontaneous polarization. They're non central symmetric, and they're also ferroelectric. So for centuries, people have been using some materials like silicon, which are particularly opaque and do not give great amount of voltages. So the material symmetry in the structure inhibits uh, it from functioning above its capability when uh, used as a solar cell photovoltaic material. So we are taking now, it is a, it is a new discovery. Um, uh, since now we have the technology enough to make good crystals, that we make lithium nibate. Now it's a man-made crystal. So, and we are investigating it or particularly uh, doing some basic research in order to form similar materials to to make uh, better performing, um, not opaque, so translucent um, solar cell photovoltaic materials. And it is interesting to study its 
um, crystalline structure and how uh, light matter interacts with this crystal structure. So as I said, so this kind of material, lithium nibate, um, or these kind of polar oxide ceramics, um, it, they are ferroelectrics and then non center symmetric. So when light is, uh, when we shine light on them, then um, the voltages that are generated from this kind of crystals um, at several orders higher than uh, the band gap. Now, the, uh, now usually in silicon, uh, the voltage that is generated, the open circuit voltage that is generated from these uh, from silicon based solar cells is lesser than the band gap, so it never exceeds the band gap. But it is fantastic that these ferroelectric non symmetric symmetry crystals, this is um, enabled. So this kind of phenomena is called the bulk photovoltaic effect. Um, so let's not uh, get too much into it, but the thing is, if you have an incident light, and you know, um, and light also has polarization, so in some specific kind of polarization of light, um, you get a current charge density. So, and this is um, sensorially dependent. And so the factor which um, determines the proportionality between the charge density and the intensity is the beta here, which is the bulk photovoltaic tensor. And it is a tensor now because of its symmetry. So because of the crystalline symmetry, which so the P here is a polarization direction. So it determines which axis of the crystal we are looking at, which axis of the crystal are you extracting the current from, um, and which face of the crystal are you shining the light to. All these kind of parameters determine uh, how the light interacts with this crystal. So it is very interesting to look into it. So as usual, we have done this adsorption spectroscopy and we can see that this is the visible wavelength um, of light that we can all see. And this is what comes to Earth mostly. Um, and exactly in that um, uh, line, in that spectrum, we can see an increase in adsorption when we are putting a transition metal, um, uh, a defect in cooperation into lithium nitrate. As I said, structure, symmetry, defects and properties. So it is also defects that you incorporate in the crystals in order to make best use of its intrinsic properties itself. So what we have here is a very fundamental experiment that we did. We shown light and we switched it off. We switched it on, switched it off and switched it on. And you can see uh, practically that you have a shift or a uh, charge generation uh, from this uh, crystal. A very simple experiment. And um, so what we did was um, we changed the polarization of light. Um, um, so either parallel to the polar axis of the crystal and perpendicular to the polar axis of the crystal. And we measured the current charge, short circuit current charge density. And then you're measuring it along the polar axis. And if the light polarization is parallel uh, to the polar axis, then the beta IKL, the short photovoltaic tensor becomes beta 333 3 because if 3 is the axis of uh, the polar, 3 is the index that we give for the current which is measured along the polar axis. So, so we measure that in different wavelengths of light. So at 532, at um, the, the green light with um, a blue light and a bit more towards the ultraviolet. Region. So 450, 470, and 532. And we've noticed that um, as the as the energy of the light or the wavelength decreased, um, we see that there is an increase um, in the uh, current charge density with increase in intensity of light. So we are increasing the power of light or intensity of light at these different wavelengths. And we see a linear uh, relation. So it is confirmed that uh, the bulk photovoltaic tensor is a proportionality factor which determines the linear relationship between the current charge density and the intensity. But of course, it is also dependent on the polarized light polarization direction. Then what we did was we, we wanted to see, is it only via the axis of polarization that we can see current? Because that is, um, that is what most people think, that along the polar axis, when we measure the current, that is what uh, that is how we get most of the current and orthogonal to it, to it. Traditionally, people have thought for several years that you wouldn't get uh, light because um, the uh, the atoms are arranged non-central symmetrically um, 
and the most of it that you'd get is only via the polar axis but we have that is not true what we saw was um so when we shone light um orthogonal to the polar polar axis of the crystal and we measured current orthogonal to the polar axis even then we could actually see um a bit of uh, current coming out um and uh, so at the same wavelength what you can see is uh, beta 3 cc which is the same thing that you had seen before so um along so yeah so along the we are measuring current along the polar axis our polar light polarization direction is also parallel to the polar axis and we are um we are measuring um, orthogonal um to the to yeah 2 to 2 2 to 2 is orthogonal we are measuring current orthogonal to the um polar axis and we are our, our light is also shown orthogonal to the polar axis so you can see that current is uh, somehow generating even orthogonal to it so then we discussed about it what is really happening so of course when you it's, it's typical of a crystal that when you shine light onto it then whatever is um so from the absorption spectra previously we realized that um, with the incorporation of iron you see that the absorption has increased so you kind of know that the initial excitation is um, especially in this wavelength is due to the iron incorporation in lithium uh, nitrate so we said okay so when we're shining a light onto the crystal to the iron ion which is sitting in the lithium site um, because of its defect incorporation is excited and it's giving an electron and to to the niobium atom uh, which is basically forming the conduction band in the crystal and and then the electron somehow jumps from one place to another and then recombines to the iron site so it drops sp2 plus becomes sp3 plus once it gives off an electron and then niobium cyclus in its valence state becomes 4 plus and then slowly after traveling without any direction the electron again recombines to one of the sa3 pluses in the entirety of the crystal um so then um, that was it but then how is it happening that's when we look into the symmetry of the crystal so when we look at it so what you're looking here at here is basically um the microscopic um atomic arrangements around the iron atom which is sitting in the lithium site so this is what you're looking at along the polar axis and what you're looking at here is a cross section so you can't see me so i can't really tell you but um so this is actually a planar structure so if you have a rod for example um and you think of a crystal as a rod um, so you are looking at this crystal in this direction and then here what you are looking at is you are actually slicing it sorry so you are slicing it and you are looking at it from the top so that is this particular area and the polar axis is along it so this is c so this is a polarization axis of in this question um so what you are seeing is the asymmetric arrangement around the iron meaning that um the lower niobium atom is below um quite far um 0.91 angstroms far further away uh, from it and this one is exactly there at 3.01 so 3.91 so there is this asymmetric arrangement so it's more easy for an electron which is excited to actually go to the niobium 7 which is on the top we no numbered it so one so you have it here 1 2 3 4 5 6 and that's what you can see here it's 1 7 and 4 and 8 the ones which are on the top and the bottom are what you see here 7 and 8 so 7 is at the top above and 8 is at the below so if you see the index here you would get to know what this you can analyze or you can um virtualize it three dimensionally in your head so along the polar axis basically an electron has more tendency to go towards the niobium 4 especially when the light excitation is parallel to the polar axis and when we look at this for example the cross section of it in the ab plane it can go anywhere basically but then it has to go in another format where the angles 
and the length of the oxygen above and below really determine exactly where um, the, the electron would go, either to ion beam 1, which are above, ion beam 1, 2, and 3 above, or ion beam 5, 6, and 4, which are below. So this actually determines and, and also depends upon the light polarization direction. So that is that kind of gives a push to the electron. So that is what we think. And once we see the symmetry, we know that there is asymmetry and there's more tendency, tendency for an electron to go to the most nearing um, niobium site. And from that, um, so we, we know that. Then uh, we will just go through uh, the way we think. So then what we did was uh, we um, took the crystal, we put it into an electron paramagnetic resonance instrument, and we saw um, if uh, the symmetry that we're thinking is really exists or not, even if we incorporate iron into the crystal. So when we put the crystal into the EPR Hall magnet, and we rotate the crystal from 90 to 270, you can see this kind of a 3M symmetry, meaning when you rotate the symmetry, you can see the SE site, and when you it disappears and it appears again, which is very nice to see actually the symmetry reflecting from the electron paramagnetic resonance. Um, so we know, so we want to see. So we have spoken about there are two things uh, which we see in the crystal, which is inherent coherent charge transport, which is excitation, and then incoherent polar on hopping. We want to see what is the how, how much each of each of these um, matter in the final charge transport. So then we we um, measured the spins of an Fe3. What you can see here is basically iron sitting in the lithium side. And since it has a 3M symmetry, whenever you move, you can see the spin of the Fe3 um, when you rotate the magnetic. So what we did was uh, we took that and we integrated the peak of the SD3 um, spins. And we, this is called spin counting procedure. So if you, you read about it, you know what is very easy, but very fantastic to know about it. So with illumination and without illumination. So we counted the spins with illumination and without illumination. Why did we do that? Because initially our spins, our balanced state of the SD is SD2 plus. And when, when we illuminate it, it, become, it is becoming Fe3 plus. And we wanted to just look at Fe3 plus. In EBR, we just look at Fe3 plus ions. So the counting of the spins of the Fe3 plus ions. The counting of the spin really translates to how many Fe3 you have after illumination and before illumination. So what we saw was, so with, with illumination um, um, from the EBR, the Fe3 plus ions they increased by a factor of 14. So meaning without illumination and before illumination, from before illumination after illumination, it, it increases by a factor of 14. But from our electrical measurements that we've seen, photovoltaic measurements that we've seen, the short circuit current increases by a factor of 26. That's already two times the higher. So there's really something else which has happened. So what is it? Um, so it must be this kind of a polaronic motion and not just, it doesn't entirely depend upon the initial existence. Meaning, the phenomena, the optical light induced phenomena that you're seeing in this crystal doesn't directly depend upon the initial excitation at all, the Fe2, the neighboring ion. But what happens to the electron once it, it went through the niobium site? So, we determined that initial excitation plays a minor role in BP above photovoltaic effect, and that uh, the polaron or the effect of what happens to the electron, the ballistic transport of the uh, electron after initial excitation is what really determines the light induced phenomena in these crystals. So by knowing this, we can um, modulate uh, the niobium sites. We can see, we can put in several other um, uh, metal defects into um, lithium niobate, or we can entirely make another material similar to lithium niobate in order to make the best use of um, the material for photovoltaic applications or light induced applications. So these are two use case scenarios I have shown you, which, which the entire properties are determined with symmetry and the structure of the crystal. So I would end it. You can look at the references. And as I've said previously, it is nice. Don't sit on your results. Even if you have results like I've spoken about currently, which are not um, yeah, which are not major, 
um, the results that I have spoken to you currently are not groundbreaking results, but definitely certain discoveries, certain revelations, and um, some things which are out of the ordinary or, or uh, out of uh, what you'd commonly see in several publications. So if you have any kind of results, I um, encourage you to publish in experimental results. It's open. It's an open uh, access, open peer review. Uh, so you'd even know good scientists or good researchers will look at your results, accept your paper. So that way you have good peer review and do publish. And I thank you very much. So I will be ending my talk here, Moaz. Sure, ma'am. Sure, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So That's if any great. questions, I will. Um, I am ready to answer. Don't shy.